morning. I would like to call the meeting of the Health and Human Services Committee to order. It is Wednesday, March 13th, 2024, and we do have a quorum present. Uh, we have first on the agenda, um, Senate File 4402, Senator Putnam. Welcome to the committee. And Senator Putnam, I see that we have a author, is this an author's amendment that, um, for your bill, would you like to have us move that author's amendment? It is, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, please. Okay. Um, Senator Bolden moves the A2 amendment. Um, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Putnam, please proceed and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning to you and to members, and thank you for giving an opportunity to visit with you. I do believe this is my first time in front of this committee, and so I have already committed a tremendous party foul by not bringing treats. Um, I apologize for that, but someday I'll make it up to you. Um, it's a secret treat rule we don't enforce, so <laughs> you're, you're okay. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, this is... Um, uh, in some ways a simple bill. I mean, I realize we say that all the time, but this one actually is. It's a simple bill that solves a profound problem. And that's the question of food insecurity on our college campuses. Today's student isn't who we think it is any longer, and their struggles are no longer quaint. Today's college student isn't just someone who's suffering through a couple years living off of ramen and natural light. Uh, their life is significantly different. Today's post-secondary student is just as likely to be a 40-year-old returning to school to make a better life as to be a recent high school graduate. Some are leaving their parents, but just as many are becoming parents. Post-secondary education is for strivers of all ages. In a recent survey of students at the University of Minnesota, we discovered that 37% of respondents were food insecure in the prior 30 days. More than a quarter of college students in Minnesota struggle with food insecurity, and expanding access to SNAP has a dramatic impact on these students. How do we know this? Uh, the Consolidated Appropriations Act, passed by Congress in 2021, included temporary exemptions to expand post-secondary student access to SNAP during the COVID public health emergency. According to the Minnesota Department of Human Services report, during this period of broader SNAP access, SNAP served 37% more post-secondary students, and food insecurity decreased among survey respondents from 73% to 32 percent. So access to SNAP benefits has a profound, deep, deep impact on the everyday lives of young people striving to make their lives better. What this bill does is leverage federal dollars at no cost to our state by changing a couple definitions and clarifying some language. In fact, if you look at the actual language of the bill, you will see the word clarifies more often than virtually any other word. Um, and that's what we're doing. We're, we're clarifying some language. We're being clear with some definitions so that our college students in Minnesota are eligible for the SNAP benefits to which they are entitled. Uh, and that will make their lives significantly better. In order to become eligible for SNAP, a student must meet one of several exemptions to the student SNAP prohibition. Some of these are working 20 hours a week, participating in work study, parenting a young child, or having a disability. After meeting an exemption, a student still has to meet the income qualifications for SNAP. Um, what this bill does is it utilizes one of the exemptions to the student SNAP prohibition. This exemption allows a student to qualify for SNAP if they are participating in a, quote, state-recognized employment and training program. The federal government sets some general guidelines on what these programs can be. They got to be public programs which lead to employment and generally serve low-income households. The feds leave the ultimate decision up to the state agency administering SNAP to determine whether a program meets the qualifications for a state employee and training program. Uh, a number of other states have passed legislation or adopted rules to clarify, to classify community colleges as state-based employment and training programs. These states include California, Ohio, and Massachusetts. Uh, Ohio also includes students at public four-year colleges. This bill allows all enrolled students to automatically meet that exemption from the SNAP prohibition and receive SNAP benefits, but again, only if they also meet income qualifications. Uh, so the bill language is the following. Subdivision 1 creates a designation for campus-based employment and training program and requires it to align with the federal parameters of a state employment and training program. It instructs institutions to apply for this designation and requires DHS to certify the institutions that meet this requirement. 
Subdivision 2 specifies the types of students who are eligible to participate in campus-based employment and training programs. Subdivision 3 requires DHS and OHE to issue guidance to institutions of higher education and local government units that administer SNAP clarifying how an institution may be certified and how a student may be eligible for SNAP benefits. Subdivision 4 requires DHS and OHE to develop an application for campus-based employment and training programs. And Subdivision 5 requires institutions that have been certified as campus-based employment and training programs to inform qualifying students that they may be SNAP eligible. Uh, Madam Chair and members, this is part of our larger effort over the past couple years to appreciate the changing scope of higher education and the demographic of those students who are striving to make their lives better. Uh, this is part of our larger coherent effort to make life more manageable for people who are trying to make their life better. Thank you for the time to present this and uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to move to our testimony of testifiers if we may. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Um, I have Jess Weiss on the list for testifying. Welcome to the committee. And please um, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, for the record, my name is Jess Weiss. Uh, Chair Wickland, Ranking Member Aki, and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Jess Weiss. I'm a Winona State University student participating in the Community Leadership Fellowship Program with Students United. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today supporting Senator Putnam's Senate File 4402. This bill is critical for many students, including me, across our state. As a Pell Grant recipient and a financially independent student, it can be challenging to balance my many bills while being a full-time student and working part-time where I sometimes work upwards to 40 hours a week to make ends meet. I sometimes limit myself to one meal a day to ensure I'll have money throughout the week to afford meals. This can make it extra difficult to focus on studying or preparing for classes. I know my story of food insecurity is not unique. Many of my peers and classmates live with the daily burden of battling hunger. It's especially hard for the many students I know who have been turned away from SNAP benefits because of the arbitrary and burdensome requirements. That's why I'm here today, urging you to support Senator Putnam's Senate File 4402. With this bill, legislators can help hungry students at no cost to our state budget. This legislation would significantly impact students across our state, including me and my peers, in Winona especially. We need broader access to SNAP benefits, and this clarification would achieve this goal. Thank you, Senator Putnam, for your leadership on this, and thank you, Chair Whitland, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Um, and that's the, the only testifier I have on the list. So uh, members, do you have questions um, for Senator Putnam? Senator Otke. Thank you, Madam Chair. And for Senator Putman, I just got a question. Um, this same group of students would now be getting the free education, right, at the state colleges with the bill that passed last year under $80,000 of income. Um, and I understand where this is going and it's federal dollars and all that, but what part of the educate, how much would it cost someone to go to school now? I mean, it looks like most everything is free, and I'm wondering about that value of education. If you don't pay for something, what value has it? So can you enlighten me a little bit on that? Senator Putnam. Thank you, uh, Chair Wicklin, and thank you for the question, Senator Aki. Um, I would say um, all of it should be free uh, in a perfect world. That's, that's, that's what we would have, because education is about bettering yourself and moving yourself from one position to the next, and to the extent that we can enable that, that's something that we should absolutely double down and do. Um, uh, I will say that uh, we're dealing with a very specific population if we're under $80,000 a year. Uh, and the other thing I think is important about this specific policy is it doesn't change who's eligible. 
in a sense. It just makes people who are already eligible aware of their eligibility and it requires institutions to make sure that students who could be entitled to this benefit actually are entitled to this benefit and able to enjoy it. Now, and I've, I've heard this question too before, specifically around the notion of uh, last dollar paid uh, college tuition, which is what we're dealing with here, with the North Star Promise. And I think that we underestimate how important time is we often say that if it's free, people aren't going to care about it, it's going to lower its value. But if you still have to put in the time, and you still have to think, and you still have to work hard, for me, time is a lot more valuable than money. And the time that you invest in something is proof that you care about it. Uh, and that, to me, is just as important as the bill that you pay. Senator Aki, no? Um, any other questions or comments about the bill? Well, I don't have see any other questions. Um, I it, it seems like this will fulfill a need, and and I hope that um, you know that those eligible would have a chance to be able to participate. So, um, your bill, Senator Putnam, um, needs to go to higher ed. Um, do you have any final comments before we make the motion? Uh, no, thank you, uh, Chair Wickham. Just. Uh Thanks for letting me hang out with you this morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for presenting. Um, Senator Bolden, um, the motion would be to recommend that Senate File 4402, as a, <clears throat> excuse me, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Higher Education. That is my motion, Madam Chair. Uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion does prevail. Senate file 4402 as amended um, is passed and referred to the Committee on Higher Education. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will move now to Senate file 3532. Senator Morrison. <clears throat> Senator Morrison, please um, proceed. This bill has been heard in commerce already. So um, if you, I believe there is an amendment, but you'll, you'll talk about that as you present the bill. Okay, if you sure. Wish. Do you want me to move the A4, Madam Chair? Um, sure, if you want to present it in that order, would you like to talk about the amendment first? Sure, I'm happy to, Madam Chair. So the, the A4 amendment makes three changes to address some of the concerns that were raised in the Commerce Committee hearing. Uh, it deletes the section related to automated process and replaces it with language that applies to the new CMS regulations on automation to utilization review organizations, health plans and claims administrators, and this new requirement's effective January 1st, 2027. Uh, it also deletes section 12, which modified the authority of the Board of Medical Practice to hold health plan medical directors accountable. Um, and third, it changes the department for which annual reports are required from Commerce to the Department of Health. Thank you. Members, do you have any questions about the amendment? I don't see any questions. Um, okay. You're welcome. Uh, Senator Morrison, do you wish to move the A4 amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to move the A4. Members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any yeah. opposed? The A4 amendment is adopted. Please proceed with your presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 3532 as amended, a bill to update and reform the prior authorization process. Prior authorization is not a new issue. It's an issue most of us have either experienced personally or have heard about from constituents who have experienced it. Prior authorization is a process by which insurers and health plans, in other words, not the attending health care providers of the patient, use to review the care that is ordered before approving whether or not they will cover it. 
They determine the prescribed or recommended care's necessity, appropriateness, and efficacy to determine the medical necessity of the recommended care for a patient. In 2020, we passed a bipartisan prior authorization reform bill that at that time was one of the strongest in the nation, actually. That bill focused on the process of prior authorization by reducing decision-making times, requiring that the person making an adverse decision be of the same or similar specialty uh, as the ordering physician and requiring health plans to post data on the use of prior authorization on their websites. Those reforms have been healthful, but helpful, but uh, practicing physicians continue to report that the number of prior authorization requirements and the complexity of those requirements have continued to increase, and the hassles and interferences of the prior authorization process have only gotten worse. National data shows that physicians complete an average of 41 prior authorizations per week. They also report that they or their staff spend more than 13 hours a week on getting prior authorization approvals. Those numbers are pretty notable, but what's worse is the impact prior authorization is having on patient care. 94% of physicians report that prior authorization has led to delays in needed care. 80% report that prior authorization can and has led to treatment abandonment by patients. And 33% report that prior authorization has led to a serious adverse event for their patients, including 19% reporting that it has been a life-threatening event or one intended to prevent a permanent impairment. So the bill before you does three main things. It focuses the use of prior authorization by prohibiting its use for services that are too important to have barriers to care. Second, it says that for chronic conditions for which the treatment doesn't change, insurers can only require prior authorization once, not every year. And it requires those re uh, requiring prior authorization to annually report to the Department of Health how often they use prior authorization, how often they approve care, and how often they deny care. Minnesota law currently prohibits prior authorization for emergency services. This has been the law for nearly 20 years, and it was approved by the legislature because everyone agreed that we do not want barriers for patients needing to be seen in the emergency room. This bill adds to current law by listing other services for which there should not be barriers. These are services that should be encouraged and for which a barrier of any kind can lead to bad patient outcomes. These include medication-assisted treatment for substance use disorder, outpatient mental health and substance use disorder treatment, anti-neoplastic cancer treatments that are consistent with the guidelines of the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which is considered the national authority on appropriate cancer therapies, any preventive service that is recommended by the United States Preventive Services Task Force, which is a national organization that recommends appropriate preventive services that should be covered based on the best available evidence pediatric hospice services, treatment for neonatal abstinence syndrome, and the use of any generic drug or biosimilar that, uh, that has been approved by the FDA. According to the insurer's own websites, these are services that are approved 80 to 95% of the time anyway. And we know that delaying care for them is dangerous. So what is the point of going through this exercise? The bill also prohibits the use of prior authorization for providers who are already accepting risk through a value-based contract. If they're overutilizing services, it will be addressed through that contract. For patients with a chronic disease like diabetes, for which the treatment rarely changes, the bill says the insurer can only require a prior authorization for the treatment once unless the standard of care changes. Because these services are usually covered in the end, this should not add cost to the insurer, but it will greatly reduce the cost to physicians, clinics, and hospitals to get approvals. That third major component of the bill is a requirement that all insurers that use prior authorization report annually to the Department of Health the, the numbers received, the numbers authorized, the numbers denied, and the numbers that were, were reversed on appeal. It's critical that we as policymakers have better data to determine if prior authorization is being used appropriately and in a way that helps our healthcare system, providers, and patients rather than harming them. Uh, I think with that, Madam Chair, uh, I will turn it over to my testifiers. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we'll call up Dr. Laurel Reese and Maureen Elderman to the table, and we can proceed with Dr. Reese. Please introduce yourself and go ahead. 
Dr. Senator Mann and um, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Laurel Reese. I'm a family physician here in St. Paul. I practice just up Rice Street. And I'm here to testify on behalf of the Minnesota Medical Association, which represents our 10,000 physician members in Minnesota, as well as the Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians. Um, prior authorization, and I'm here to, in strong support of SF3532, prior authorization is delaying care for our patients, and it's getting in the way of the care that we're recommending for our patients. If you ask your doctor what is the number one hassle in their field, prior authorization is going to be the thing that you're going to hear over and over. It's what our members tell us over and over. Um, in our burnt out workforce, this is one of the things that's catching us on fire. <laughs> so prior authorization is a big deal. Um, it was originally a tool that was meant to control costs for niche or really expensive medications, but it has just expanded broadly and now includes routine care and generic medications. Um, this is resulting in unnecessary use of already stretched too thin health care and more importantly, it's delaying care for our patients and it's getting in the way of them getting the care that's recommended by their physicians. And I'll give you an example of a patient of mine who um, was well controlled on high doses of insulin for her diabetes. Um, she ran out of insulin. She called the pharmacy to get her refill like she always does. And they said, we're sorry, you need prior authorization for that. So um, she called her daughter who called our clinic. The pharmacy sent the information to our clinic. Um, our nurse sent the message to me. I got the message and um, sent the information to our pharmacist to work on it. The pharmacist knew that Minnesota has a program that will get emergency insulin, so he contacted the social worker to help the daughter fill out the paperwork to get the, prior, to get the emergency insulin. So the daughter came by after work, picked up the paperwork, took it to the pharmacy, and she got her insulin. Now, if that hadn't happened, um, she would have been in the ICU because without that insulin, she can't live. Um, but we made it work. Um, I saw her back in the clinic two weeks later. Later, um, she said, you know, I haven't heard back on that prior authorization yet. Um, so our nurse called the the pharmacy who sent in the request to see if it was covered, and it was covered, and so she got her insulin. And the really good news, we don't have to do this again until next year. Um, so that's the benefit of chronic medications, being able to approve things once and not having to do it over and over again. Um, yesterday, I had a, a different patient with diabetes who I sent in a request for a new medication, one that will both lower his blood sugars and protect his kidneys. And they said, nope, you have to get prior authorization. That one's not covered, but you can get this other one that doesn't protect the kidneys as well. And this was a gentleman I'm worried about his kidneys, you know, and he's going to go on to dialysis at some point. And the longer I can delay his dialysis, um, the better it is for my patient, number one. But it's also going to cost a lot less because dialysis is really, really expensive. Um, so what we're trying to do here is relieve the burden on our patients, on our health care teams. We're trying to make sure that the patients get the evidence-based, cost-effective care that's recommended by their physicians and including the things like generic medications or mental health care, cancer treatments, um, and also the increasing transparency is going to be really helpful for everybody involved. So we do ask for your support for SF3532. Thank you, Dr. Reese. Uh, Maureen Alderman. Hi, thank you, committee members. <clears throat> My name is Maureen Alderman. I'm a resident of Victoria, Minnesota, and I serve as a patient advocate on the Minnesota Rare Disease Advisory Council. Professionally, I work in food safety and regulatory, but more importantly, I'm the mother to two incredible children, Cameron and Caroline. I'm here to speak in support of SF3532, testifying on my own behalf. Caroline was born in November 2020, and thanks to the newborn screening, discovered to have a very rare health condition just two days after birth. Caroline has a condition known as arginosinicilic acidurea, ASA for short, a type of urea cycle disorder. This means that her body cannot fully digest protein and instead creates ammonia, which can be lethal to your body. When Caroline was born, we were given a very bleak outlook for her life. This is her today at three years old, thriving. By the grace of God, we found a world-renowned specialist for urea cycle disorders right at our own doorstep at the University of Minnesota. Under her care team at the U, Caroline's development has far exceeded every, um, what we could have ever imagined. In those early NICU days, we were told that Caroline's health would have an immediate impact on her IQ and overall development. This is just something that no parent wants to ever hear about with their baby. 
However, Caroline's incredible doctors paired with the proper diet and medication has allowed her to have less frequent doctor visits, lab draws, and more freedom to be a healthy, happy, thriving toddler. Caroline will forever be on three prescription medications as her condition is chronic. One is a revolutionary drug called Revicti, which is considered an ammonia scavenger. This medication maintains Caroline's ammonia level if she were ever going to crisis, as they call it. Revicti is unfortunately only available at two pharmacies in the country and has no generic or other medication that can replace it. Because Revicti is expensive and rare, annually our insurance would love to replace it for something else. Every year at the end of June, my husband and I have a calendar reminder that says prior auth for Revicti because on July 1st, we know we will receive a letter saying that our coverage expires and requires that we go through the extensive prior authorization process. Now, thankfully, we have an incredible care team that knows how to fight this battle. Our doctor knows what to write in the letter to the insurance company to explain the criticality this medication plays in their patients' lives, so there's no delay in Caroline receiving this medication. However, many chronically ill patients are not this fortunate. You may wonder, well, what happens to your daughter's health without her medicine? Everywhere Caroline goes, we carry what's called an emergency letter with us, because if she gets sick and her ammonia gets high, it isn't weeks that we could see impacts. It is hours, and doctors have told us it truly could be minutes. Without her medication, instead of playing in her yard with her big brother, she could be in a coma in the hospital. It is hard to explain the stress endured, knowing that the medications are out there to keep you or your loved ones healthy, but insurance or paperwork may be keeping you from it. This should not be how we operate in a state known for exceptional medical care. So as I sit here, knowing my two healthy, beautiful children can't wait for me to get home, please think of Caroline and all of the other families dealing with chronic conditions that could be making memories together instead of on the phone with insurance companies or even worse, sitting bedside in a hospital together. Thank you, Senator Morrison, for your work on this, and thank you for your time, committee members. Thank you, Ms. Elderman. Uh, Dr. Ntaba. Madam Chair, uh, committee members, my name is Dr. Ziwe Ntaba, and I've been practicing emergency medicine for about 20 years now. I'd like to dedicate my testimony this morning on behalf of all the preventable and premature death certificates that have been filled out because of unnecessary delays from the prior authorization process. A few years ago, I treated a 17-year-old patient in our emergency room who was brought in after a fentanyl overdose. Uh, we were able to stabilize him with a medication called buprenorphine, uh, and once stable, he told me that he felt normal again for the first time uh, since he left high school. He had dropped out of high school, he'd been kicked out of his loving home, uh, and he was looking for an exit ramp from his life of addiction. During this moment of clarity, he told me he was afraid of two things. He was afraid of dying, and he was afraid of the opioid overdose, over, opioid withdrawal syndrome, which can be very tortuous, physically, emotionally, psychologically painful. You see, it only takes about 24 hours from last use for somebody struggling with opioid addiction to start experiencing uh, these symptoms, and their daily lives are basically driven by a fear of avoiding that withdrawal state. These patients go into survival mode at that case, uh, they're in fight or flight mode, and their brain tells them that they need to use again in order to survive. So buprenorphine, on the other hand, is a life-saving medication which works by normalizing that hormonal activity in the brain. This is in a manner analogous to insulin for diabetes. Buprenorphine eliminates withdrawal symptoms, it eliminates the cravings, and it also protects from overdose uh, in the long term. But we only have these small opportunities, these small windows of opportunity uh, in time to start patients on medication before they go into that withdrawal symptom. Um, they then get, if, if they're not treated, they then get pulled back into self-medicating uh, with all the addictive behaviors uh, that are associated with untreated addiction. So our patients physically cannot wait for a prior authorization process. Opponents may argue that prior authorization is in the patient's best interest or that it exists to ensure that treatments are medically necessary, but these notions are disprovable by death certificates and data. Furthermore, each of these premature and preventable deaths is associated with thousands of uncounted stories of harm for the patients, 
for the patient families, uh, for entire communities across the state. Much of that societal impact is avoidable if we can get these patients the necessary medications and care where and when they need it. I don't know if that 17-year-old patient ever found his exit ramp, but I do know that adolescents have the highest rates of prior authorization denial, uh, they have the lowest rates of access to treatment, and they have the steepest climb in overdose fatalities across the country. For teenagers, that's been a tripling in these deaths in just three years. But the best news is that by starting and maintaining these patients on medications like buprenorphine, along with a seamless transition to care when they leave the ER or the hospital, we can improve their five-year survivability by over 400%. This bill fixes many problems by reducing barriers to access for life-saving medications and treatment. Thank you for the honor of participating in this process in support of this important legislation. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, next, we'll go to Zoom. Nicole Hilgis. Thank you, Chairman and committee members. My name is Nicole Hilgis, and I'm the manager of prior authorizations at Children's Minnesota. I appreciate you having me here today to express our support for Senate File 3532, which makes changes to prior authorization requirements that would allow us to better serve our patients and their families. Children's Minnesota is the state's largest pediatric healthcare system, seeing more than 160,000 kids annually. In 2023, the 30 members of our prior authorization team worked to complete over 81,000 requests for nearly 58,000 individual patients. These were children suffering from cancer, heart conditions, asthma, and other diseases that needed prior authorization or PA approvals before our clinicians could treat them with the appropriate medications and healthcare services. Today, I want to share the impact this has had on one of our patient families. James, whose name has been changed to protect our patient's privacy, is an 11-year-old boy who has been diagnosed with leukemia and is insured through Medicaid. Three months ago, my team submitted a PA request for a drug to treat James's cancer and learned that it was denied because the drug we requested, though it is the standard of care for this illness, was not the preferred drug for Medicaid. Medicaid instead recommended we try two other drugs not approved for a patient James's age before the drugs uh, before using the drugs they denied. The drugs suggested do not follow the recommended standard of care outlined by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines and are not drugs that we would use to treat a patient like James. My team and I are still working to appeal this denial on behalf of James's family so they can focus on their child's care without additional stress. James's story is not unique. In another case for a request for a liquid form of medication for a patient with a cardiovascular condition, um, was denied for a tablet, and a, a, I'm sorry, was denied and a tablet was suggested instead. The patient was two months old. Getting PA approvals for liquid medications that can be appropriately dosed for young children has also been a challenge for patients in hospice and those experiencing neonatal withdrawals. Our prior authorization team and members of the care teams serving these patients work tirelessly on cases like these, spending hours working on individual PA requests while trying to protect patient and families from additional worries and concerns. After going back and forth with denials and appeals on these cases, over 95% of the requests eventually do get approved. But too often the time it takes to complete the process threatens to delay patient care, leaving families to make the difficult decision to move forward with their child's treatment without knowing if it will be covered by their insurance. These are not things a family should have to worry about while their child is fighting a life-threatening illness. We can do better for the children and families living in our state, and Senate File 3532 gives us that opportunity. Thank you, Senator Morrison, for your leadership on this bill, and thank you, committee members, for your time. Thank you. Next on Zoom, we have Michelle Crimmins. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Wickland and members of the Senate Health and Human Services Committee. My name is Michelle Crimmins. I am a registered lobbyist representing Prime Therapeutics, a pharmacy benefit manager headquartered in Egan, Minnesota, speaking in opposition to Senate File 3532. In previous hearings, we've heard testimony on the burden that prior authorization causes for providers. Yet, this has already been addressed. 
In 2010, Minnesota passed a law requiring the use of electronic prior authorization, often referred to as EPA. This EPA process is in real time and when utilized will not delay a patient from receiving a prescription that's covered for their condition. The law was a great first step in improving the prior authorization process, but prescribers have not reached 100% adherence with the law. Adhering to current law would go a long way to addressing the burden. We've also heard a lot about Senate File 3204, the Minnesota law passed in 2020 that set reasonable requirements for use of prior authorization, such as annual posting of prior authorization data on the plan's website, that ensures transparency, a limit on prior authorization data request requirements addressing the concerns about the processing time, required health plan change notifications that ensure proper communication with members, plans, and providers, a requirement for any adverse determination to be made by a licensed physician in the same area of practice as the prescribing physician, and many more. Senate File 3204 was touted as the answer to all of the problems raised by Minnesota physicians, but unfortunately, Minnesota Medicaid and state employee plans were excluded from this law because of the significant financial impact of plans. That financial impact has been felt by Minnesotans insured in the commercial market and Minnesota employers. As we continue to hear physicians raise concerns about turnaround times or physicians in different fields of study making adverse determinations on a prior authorization, it's important to bear in mind that the law is already in place for commercial plans to follow these guidelines, but Minnesota Medicaid and state employee plans are exempt. After enacting the solution to prior authorization, we're now here to discuss Senate File 3532, which almost entirely removes prior authorization through broad categorical prior authorization bans like the bill's ban on prior authorizations for generic drugs or multi-source brand name drugs and a prior authorization ban on any drug used to treat a chronic condition. Broad bans such as these raise concerns for patient safety. As example, removal of prior authorization on all substance use disorder treatment includes methadone, which is an opiate, and the financial burden to Minnesota employers and citizens. This bill will have a significantly larger financial impact than Senate File 3204. Thankfully, this time around, Minnesota Medicaid and state employee plans are included in the current draft of the bill. After all, if Senate File 3204 was the answer to prior authorization, it should have included the state Medicaid program in state employee plans. And should the committee find Senate File 3532 to be good public policy for Minnesota's employers, and commercially insured, then it should also be considered good policy for Medicaid and state employee plans. Because of the cost and safety impacts of Senate File 3532, and new, um, Prime Therapeutics opposes the bill. I welcome any questions. Thank you, Ms. Crimmins. Next in person, we have Nick Zerwas. And Dan and Dreesen can come down to the table as well. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning, members. My name is Nick Sirwas with the Jacobson Law Group. Uh, on uh, this morning here on behalf of AHIP, the American Health Insurance Providers. Thank you to Senator Morrison uh, for her work and dedication to improve health care in Minnesota, including several years of working on prior authorization. Prior authorization is critical ins to ensuring safe, effective, and cost-efficient health care for patients. Prior auth is a proven tool that ensures patients get the most up-to-date, evidence-based care and prevents clinical deviations that could, at times, adversely affect, impact patients. Health insurance providers collaborate with health care providers and other stakeholders to implement innovative solutions to continually improve the prior authorization process. However, the need for prior authorization to remain is evident. 
30% of all health care spending in the United States may be unnecessary spending and in some cases harmful to patients, according to a recent journal of American, the American Medical Association uh, report. Every year, low-value care costs the U.S. health care system nearly $340 billion, according to that same report. And further, 87% of doctors have reported negative impacts from that low-value care. One of our main concerns is the overly broad and all-encompassing uh, chronic condition carve-out uh, in the bill that might result in an increase of unnecessary or inappropriate testing procedures and prescriptions. What we do know is, and, and certainly you know as policymakers, a very small number of prescriptions and medical procedures and total claims, often less than 5% of total claims, can result and be a huge cost driver and account for nearly half of health care spending. Medication-assisted treatment is an important and effective substance abuse treatment that relies on timely commencing treatment upon a patient's readiness for success, and we certainly support MAT. However, we believe the current prior authorization emergency exemption already in Minnesota statute would allow the initial MAT treatment and allow plenty of time for prior authorization for subsequent treatments. As a previous testifier mentioned, um, oftentimes the drugs used in medication-assisted treatment um, are narcotics, and often strong narcotics, and we strongly believe in keeping the prior authorization guardrails that exist in place uh, to prevent abuse. Members, of, members every year uh, of the legislature and folks that come down here to testify often raise concerns about higher and higher health care costs and insurance costs. And every year, policymakers put forward uh, bills that would limit the tools that insurers have to keep costs down, whether it's frozen formularies, whether it's changes in prior authorization, the tools remaining in the toolbox for insurers to help do their part through utilization review to keep costs down are slowly but surely uh, being limited and mitigated. Utilization review can make sure only medically necessary work is being done and help mitigate the ever increasing costs. And we can strike a balance to make sure that patients that need time, timely care and appropriate care get that care but we're able to do it after review and being uh, cognizant of the increased costs. Again, we thank Senator Morrison for her work uh, in this area and pledge to continue uh, to work with her as this bill moves throughout the process. Thank you, thank you Mr. Zerwas. Uh, Mr. Andreessen. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Dan Andreessen with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans, Trade Association for Minnesota's nonprofit insurers, which includes Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, Health Partners, Medica, Sanford Health Plan, and UCARE. Our members want the PA process to work as efficiently as possible. And as we said in previous testimony, if any of the stories you've heard today involve a council member bland, please come talk to us so we can find solutions. Patients should not be put in the middle of this process. However, the council is opposed to broadly eliminating the use of PA as a way to solve problems because of the complexity and cost of health care. PA is a real-time double-check on health care services and treatments to check if the care is being delivered is safe and appropriate and that providers are promoting lower-cost options so patients are not overpaying for their care. Every session we hear about rising out-of-pocket costs and the growing problem of medical debt. Council health plans try to be targeted in their use of PA and it's not used for all health care services. Over 98% of our claims do not involve PA. It is focused on services and treatments which have the potential to cause significant patient harm, have a high cost, have various alternatives or for services in which plans see a track record of inappropriate or fraudulent care. But we know providers have concerns over PA and that's why we negotiated with them on legislation that you've heard about in 2020 uh, regarding the timelines and other uh, requirements. That law requires that all PAs must be done within five business days. If a provider requests an expedited review, that has to be granted and be done within 48 hours. Now, it's important to note that that law only applies to the fully insured commercial market, which is the individual plans you would buy on Minsure or the small uh, business market. 
Uh, it does not apply to the Medicaid Minnesota Care, and it doesn't apply to the large employers that are in the universal market because of federal preemption. So if there are concerns about delays in care, we're wondering if they're coming from markets that weren't covered by this 2020 law. Regarding Senate File 3532, we have many questions about provisions of the bill, but here are just a few. Uh, generally, how will this interact with the new federal rule published last month on PA, oper PA and oper interoperability? Our plans are still digesting that 822-page rule, um, and we do think there are some contradictions in the bill. Uh, the new Section 7 requiring plans to create an automated process, um, aligning that with the CMS rule uh, may address some of those co uh, contradictions, uh, but we're still looking through that language. Uh, but do want to point out there is no language in there requiring providers to use this automated process, uh, and we would say that if providers want this process, they should be required to use it. Section 7 and 8 list several conditions in which uh, PA would be exempted, uh, but there's no consideration for future changes in medical practices or new treatments and the costs associated with those changes. Look at the change we've seen in treatments for obesity and the new drugs that are now on the market for over $1,000 a month. If you support this bill, you may believe that the exemptions in the bill make sense today, but what happens in five to 10 years when treatments change and data suggests that PA is reinstated? Can we expect providers will support reinstating prior authorization? And lastly, Section 9 references an exemption to value-based arrangements. It's not clear how this is going to impact current uh, value-based contracts, and uh, which improve value and affordability uh, for enrollees. Uh, we don't want to create roadblocks that stop using these contracts in the future. Uh, as this bill moves forward, we're committing to working with Senator Morrison and proponents on the bill, but at this time are opposed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andreessen. Uh, uh, Michelle Benson and Bentley Graves, if you can both come up. And Ms. Benson, you can introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair. Senator Morrison and committee members, I'm Michelle Benson with the Health Plan Partnership of Minnesota, including Alina Health Aetna, Cigna, and United Healthcare. Um, I want to begin by thanking Senator Morrison. The amendment this morning showed that some of the things we've talked about are being considered, and that's a critical part of successful legislation. We appreciate that very much. Um, our health plans learned a lot during COVID, including key lessons about how prior authorization impacts patients. And many of our plans are proactively reforming the prior authorization process, seeking alignment with the CMS rules that are emerg emerging, and establishing a standardization of interoperability of electronic health information, including those that impact prior authorization. As interoperability and electronic prescribing increases, how much of the administrative bur burden of prior authorization is due to non-electronic prescribing? Handwritten notes are still used by many providers. It's hard to have interoperability with handwritten notes for prescribing handwritten prescriptions. I mean, no disrespect to the doctors in the room. In this dynamic environment, we appreciate alignment with emerging federal standards and an acknowledgement that electronic prescribing would help to avoid the added expense and complexity that a patchwork uh, approach to prior authorization would cause. Testimony presented in committee this morning has conveyed important stories of the impact of ineffective burdensome prior authorization policies. One of the testifiers stated that their patient coverage was provided by Medicaid. This raises the question that has been lifted before this committee by previous testifiers. To what extent will this prior authorization apply to Minnesota's many payer types? PMAP, medical assistance fee for service, encompassing the preferred drug list, Minnesota Care, the fully insured market, and ERISA plans, including CGIP, over which you have purview. James's story points us to the fact that if we do not include these public programs, we will not be addressing the full scope of the impact of prior authorization. We are concerned that the report being compiled, and while there have been changes since the introduction of the bill, we thank uh, Senator Morrison for that, some of the disclosures might put proprietary information at risk or call out particular uh, plans. We would appreciate that the data be aggregated or at least de-identified, but it would also be helpful to policymakers to understand are the problems coming from paper versus electronic prescribing, payer type, are public programs, ERISA, or if it's the individual market which is regulated here in this body. 
We thank you for your generosity in hearing concerns. We believe that advances in technology will help to address some of the administrative burden of prior authorization while maintaining patient safety and providing value. We appreciate Senator Morrison, the committee, and you, Madam Chair, for considering the impact federal rules will have and the necessity of including public programs and CGIP as this bill moves forward. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Ms. Benson. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Bentley Graves with the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. <clears throat> Uh, we, like many here in, in, in uh, the hearing today, have been part of this discussion around prior auth for a number of years, including going back to 2020. And in all of that, our effort has been uh, focused on maintaining the usefulness of prior authorization and ensuring quality and safety, but also as a tool for cost containment. Um, now, we also want to make sure that there are opportunities to look uh, to figure out how to how to make sure that prior auth is brought uh, in line with today's technology and today's healthcare ecosystem, and we're we're pleased that that we think that there are there are pieces of the conversation in the bill uh, at issue here today that would that would do just that while actually addressing the problems that have been raised with prior auth. So we've heard uh, issues around delay uh, for both providers and patients, uh, administrative cost increases as a result, uh, and just general hassle uh, with regard to the prior authorization process. Given that, we're very pleased that this bill continues to move us in the direction of an, of an automated prior auth system, something that both on the front end tells providers in real time what needs to be submitted uh, with regard to the prior auth, but also the back end gives them some sense of what the decision is uh, to move forward with them with their patient. But similarly, and, and, and I will say, I don't, you heard, you heard Mr. Andreessen speak to this a little bit, I don't know that the language that's in the bill does this quite right, but, but the idea of looking at this as an opportunity to lean into value-based payments uh, we think makes a lot of sense, not just with regard to uh, how it might address issues within the prior auth uh, system, but frankly, how it might address larger problems in, in issues in our healthcare system overall, not least of which is, is cost. And again, I don't know that that language is quite right to date, um, but we certainly want to continue to work on that as an issue with uh, Senator Morrison and others as we, this bill moves forward. Um, we are... Uh, we would note that uh, earlier changes to this bill did pull back uh, on a proposal to exempt a whole host of providers from, from prior authorization and instead uh, ask the department to review that idea along with the data that they'll now be collecting and analyzing. We think that makes a lot of sense. Um, respectfully, we would suggest that maybe we take the same approach to, uh, to the ideas in the bill to exempt uh, uh, certain services. Um, Finally, Madam Chair, I would just say that we uh, uh, we look forward to this conversation moving forward. In particular, in particular, we look forward to um, whatever information can additionally be brought to this by way of the fiscal note. We have very few means to understand at times the the impact of decisions like this on the commercial market, uh, but a fiscal note will at least give us some sense of what that looks like. Certainly for the for the public pay uh, enrollees, but I think will give us a sense too of what some of that impact might look like uh, in the commercial market as well. So that will help inform our. Our discussions going forward are on our engagement going forward, but we want to thank Senator Morrison for uh, her willingness to talk with us thus far and for the changes that have been made and look forward to uh, what's to come. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Grace. With that, uh, that is the end of our list of testifiers. Anybody else out there who wishes to testify? Seeing none, members, questions, comments? Senator Abel. Well, here we go again, um, Madam Chair and Senator Morrison, thanks for bringing up the topic. Um, and uh, the, the testimony was everything I expected, except uh, Ms. Benson had novel testimony. I appreciate her bringing in uh, some new thoughts into the discussion. The problem is that it's a problem. And I'm 45 years in practice, I'm a low utilizer, and I'm burdened with the same requirements of prior authorization as people that are abusive. I have to do prioritizations in some cases that get me $2.22 net. Serious, there's a copay and that's what's left. And so to be a good provider, I have to do this. And it's madness. Um, the, I ran into a the cardiologist visited me on Dr. Day and I don't recall the procedure, um, but there was a procedure he has to get prior authorized. But if the person goes to the hospital, they don't have to. And so he spends 20 minutes or so on to get this procedure approved on the phone and it gets approved, but he's wasting his valuable time on that. And like, it's just not a good idea to, when there aren't enough cardiologists around at our little cardiology center up our way, um, to have him on the phone 
20 minutes to get something that if the people just went to the ER, they get admitted and it's for free. And so now they're to the insurers who are out here. So what you're promoting is hospitalization instead of an outpatient thing. Now tell me the value in that. Um, and the problem is the clinician. The problem isn't the procedure. There's a bell curve of the way doctors treat. And there's some doctors who not, you know, criticizing the field, but they're, you look at the way doctors utilize just in their own business. I learned from a Delta lobbyist one time that it's, it, that it's in the head of the clinician. And so there's a bell curve of how any doctor handles stuff, and the people that are below the 70th percentile, leave them alone because they don't overutilize anyway. I'll predict Dr. Morrison and Dr. Mann do just really quality work, and, and, and they don't go out of their way to find out what they can get. There are some individuals in every field who have found a way to like, maximize a case, and they do everything. And the hospitals will learn to scrub the bills to make sure they don't miss a thing. Well, let's talk about that. But Senator Morrison, you're on to something. The problem is there, and I hope the insurers would figure out how you're really wasting money on the wrong things. And so what happens is by burdening clinicians like me for $2.22, you make me go like, I think I'm just going to give up the practice. And so then we leave, and who do you leave? The people that know how to make a lot of money. And it's... I'm not trying to say that doctors overdo, but there are certain ones. Scrutinize them. Prior authorize them for whatever they do. That's where the, and, and relieve the lower 80 percentile of doctors from the burden of let them do their craft and not put these families at risk, and not waste their time and drive up costs more. Because I'm telling you, to all the people who testified, I appreciate you, I know you all personally, but you're on the wrong track. And, and so we have to spend time with a bill like this where Dr. Morrison's trying to chase around and in between federal regulations and whatever to do the obvious, which is the people that are doing a good job, tell them thank you and leave them alone. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Good job. Keep up with the good work. Thank you, Senator Abler. Other questions, comments? Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, First question would be for Senator Morrison. As this currently sits, do, do you plan on covering, uh, or would all government pay programs be included in this? Senator Morrison. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Adke, yes, uh, medical assistance and Minnesota Care are included. Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, conversations that we've been hearing, um, the last was, what, 2020, when pr some prior authorization language was passed but all the government pays were cut out. So less than 18% of our population is, was affected by that. Um, but do we know where the problems are coming from? We hear that there's, um, you know, 98% of the claims, there's, there's, they don't, there isn't even a prior auth. Um, and I'm kind of wondering, you know, being that the uh, government pay programs weren't included, is that some of where our problem is? Can you, can you enlighten me on where this issue really surfaces? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and Senator Okay, You know, we heard a lot um, about all the money um, that we are, I, I heard someone say $340 billion of low value care. 30% of spending is unnecessary spending. And I would just redirect everyone's attention to the list of medications that, and services that we're talking about. These, so, you know, insulin for diabetics, I, I don't think that that is um, low value care. Um, substance use disorder, we have a national crisis. Making sure you heard Dr. Nataba talking about the importance of starting people right away in the emergency room on medication assisted treatment. Um, neonatal abstinence syndrome that this is not low value care. So they may be referring to things that are not a part of this bill. These are things that keep people healthy. They're, they're evidence-based preventative services. Um, so I feel like there's been a little bit of misdirection as we talk about this bill. Um, these, are, these, are, these are basic things that keep people healthy. Senator Rocky. Thank you, Madam Chair. A um, few things there that we just touched on to um, if the health plans are not involved in these decisions, um, how do we control costs? Because 
it, it's been said many times, most providers are going to do the right thing and, you know, the, the 80 percent plus, but still, they're the payer. Um, don't they have a right to be involved in the, at least the decision um, so that they know what's coming? Senator Morrison. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and S Senator Utke. Um, I, I don't think anyone's arguing that the health plans are not involved. <laughs> I think they're they're very involved in this. Um, I, I, c could you repeat your question, Senator Utke? You want you're remember, talking about containing costs. I, it, I know. Yeah. I think you we're talking about containing costs, Senator Utke. And um, you know we spend a lot of money on health care in the United States of America, and we are getting worse outcomes. Um, so this list, I redirect us again to this list. This is primarily about preventative health care and health care that if people don't get it, they may die. So this is, this is kind of really basic stuff that's about keeping people healthy and preventing death. Um, Keeping people healthy will prevent long-term costs. Senator Abler referred to, uh, let's keep people out of the hospital. Some of these are things that will keep people out of the hospital, which is obviously much more expensive care and a much bigger burden on our system. Senator Rocky. Thank you, Madam Chair. I guess we all agree we're all about health care, but prior auth is not going to cause anybody to die. You know, that probably taking it a little too far. But um, Senator, Rocky, Senator. We have we heard... <laughs> from testifiers saying that that's what it's doing because it's delaying care. People aren't getting the care that they need, and so people are dying. Senator Aki, that's Madam Senator Chair. Um, Madam Chair and Senator Aki, the, the list that, was, that we've come up with is based on just that, that these are medications and services for which if the care is delayed, it can harm the patient. That's the whole impetus for the, the list that we have. Senator Aki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've got some uh, questions uh, in the bill, and if we could, starting, um, this is in section four, so page two, um, and actually uh, line 24 under adverse determinations, is when we get to the part where it says less intensive, is that something that really describes a level of care, and who determines that? Senator Morrison. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Aki, could you repeat the uh, where in the bill you're referring sure. to? Sure. Uh, page 2, line 24. Uh, provided all information reasonably necessary to make a determination. I, I think I have a different reference. <laughs> On on 24, uh, that's where it says uh, an authorization an authorization for health care service that is less intensive than the health care service specified in the original request. But I was wondering about that less intensive. Um, a definition for that, or is that, um, I'm kind of thinking that's pretty broad, and who determines that? Madam Chair, are you going to assist me? Um, Madam Chair and Senator Utke, I assume that that we're referring to um, just what it says, a care that is less intensive. Less in and it looks like it's determined by the Utilization Review Organization. Okay. I just, as I read that, it just seems like it's less intensive, could be different to each and every provider, but okay, we'll move on. Um, Mm -hmm. 
I do have. Um, ooh, sorry. Center up. <laughs> the coffee bit the dust, unfortunately. Um, going when you do talk about these people that have ongoing um, long-term uh, treatment plans and the medications, and we want to take and rather than to have it reviewed and have a prior auth yearly, we want to just open up and run forever. Um, I have questions and concerns on that due to the fact that medications do change um, over time and we can't just change randomly and expect the, the process to work. So wouldn't leaving in the one year still be a good, I mean one year is a long time and uh, I mean no matter what we have, we're going to visit our provider within that period and prior auth and the renewal would seem to be just a natural occurrence. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Aki. The bill is written so that if the standard of care changes, the, the provider and the patient are notified and that is an exception to that. But if you're taking the same dose of insulin, there's no reason to go through that process again. You, you heard from our patient advocate and her experience with her daughter with this very rare disease where the, the it doesn't change and it's life-threatening if she doesn't have access to that medication, she still has to go through this process annually and it's a laborious, very frustrating process for the family and for her providers. Senator Rucky. Okay. Um, white. Let's touch on the reporting. You go back to section 11. <clears throat> you got annual, annual reporting to the Commissioner of Health, and it goes through all these various steps. What do we hope to gain from that? Because it appears to be a, a burden mandate uh, put on the plans that it's going to uh, take a fair amount of time to put this together. Is there going to be, do you anticipate usable results? Senator Morrison. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Aki, yes, laborious process. That sounds familiar. <laughs> Um, yes, I think this is very important that uh, we gather the information so that we have real numbers. Some of the plans have been pretty good about reporting their data. Others, it's either hard to find or they haven't been as compliant. Um, it's really important that we have real numbers on the frequency of the use of prior authorization, how often it's denied. Um, this is important information for us to have um, so that we can optimize the process going forward. Okay. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I get just down to the point where I, of course, don't like the bill. Um, I think that the prior auth still um, provides a, re uh, a, a good tool that uh, is going to help control costs. I mean, our costs are on a runaway train, um, but this is only going to speed it up, and we got to figure out a way to um, reel in the costs and pull them back. And if we're just telling the plans that, okay, whatever bill we send you, you're going to pay, we know where our rates are going. And then the other part of it is we continue to penalize this small group of Minnesotans that are still working in this market um, because we can't touch the ERISA plans. And then when we get the fiscal note and see how large it is for government pay, are we going to pull back and again just go after this little group? That's what scares us because they carry the burden on every mandate that I see go through here. So um, that's just my concern going forward. So um, I would imagine this is being laid over. So, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your comments, Senator Aki. I just would reiterate that this does not eliminate prior authorization. This eliminates it for services for which a delay of care is dangerous to the patient. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Morrison, for bringing this bill. Um, this has been an interesting uh, conversation. Um, I want to thank the testifiers um, for bringing your expertise and your experience. Um, I will say, as was sort of mentioned in the testimony as I talk to providers, this is the number one thing that comes up as a frustration um, as they talk about a barrier to the care that they want to provide to their patients. Um, I will also say personally, I experienced this frequently um, in the care to my son. Literally this morning, I was on a phone call um, trying to navigate prior authorization for a 
medically necessary test. Um, so thank you for bringing this. Um, I would love it, honestly, if we would do away with all prior authorization completely, but this bill does not do that, um, but does take a step to improve care for patients. And, you know, as we, uh, there was a comment in the, the testimony around concerns for patient safety, which is really sort of mind boggling to me that we think that insurance companies know better what is safe for patients than physicians and providers. That's really outrageous to me. Um, you know, when physicians and providers say that patients need care, a medication, a procedure, whatever it may be, they are, they are the care providers. They are the ones who should decide that, not insurance companies. As we talk about costs, again, hearing the, the testimony, the scores of people who are, their job is to navigate this ridiculous system those people, <laughs> that's money that is going not to care. It's money that's going to navigate this system. As we talk about all the time, hours that physicians and providers are spending to navigate this ridiculous system, that is also time that is not being devoted to patient care. This could look very different, and it should. Um, we should be removing barriers to care for patients. This is harming patients in many ways every day. And so thank you for bringing this bill because we need to change it. Other questions, comments, members? Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Senator Morrison, uh, I would like to echo what Senator Abler said as I also run a small clinic and I unfortunately get burdened very often with prior authorization. Um, it seems pretty, pretty uh, minuscule that I have to submit a prior authorization for about 10 patients a week to get $2 well, 22 cents as he also works in the same field. So um, it, it gets to be a really long process. Uh, and sometimes, you know, doctors are so burdened with paperwork and things like that. And then it gets forgotten. And then on top of that $2.22 that I didn't submit the form for on time, now I lose the income for the patient that I, that I saw. It was a, me a necessary, medically necessary treatment. I don't, I don't go around doing my pr um, procedures just on everybody because I want to. I do it because the patients come to the office because they need the care. They're not, they're not there <clears throat> asking for something because they don't need it. Um, and, and somebody, you know, the discussion of, okay, it costs money. Uh, you know, if we don't have these prior authorizations, we're not going to save money. Well, I'm pretty sure it costs money to have a peer of review every single time I submit a prior authorization. That costs money. Uh, the paperwork costs money. It costs me time, which costs money. Um, you know, something, something that I find interesting is the argument one-sided on, on how much it costs, and I think there's costs on the other side, too. Um, and so something that I, I would just like to say thank you for bringing it forward. It's definitely a discussion that needs to be had, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Members, other comments? Um, Dr. Morrison, Senator Morrison, thank you for uh, bringing this bill forward. Um, we just heard stories about people and patients suffering, families who are struggling because of this, people dying because of this. Um, and then we heard that there were 81,000 prior auth requests in one system just for kids. And, and then we hear this is a useful tool. And then when people say that, I think to myself, how stupid do I look right now? How stupid do I look that I'm supposed to believe that in one system, 81,000 times a doctor wrote the wrong prescription or prescribed the wrong treatment for a patient, and that 81,000 times in one system, they caught that and saved money. That's absurd. Um, and then we heard stories about the fact that when these prior offs come back, they prescribe tablets for two-month-olds and adult medication for children. So from someone who's never seen my patient, talked to my patient, or touched my patient, they think that they know the treatment for my patient better than me or a physician who's been sitting with that patient for months or years or their lifetime. Patients who have been on medications for decades and all of a sudden, they go to the pharmacy, they can't get their medications anymore because their prior auth didn't go through. <clears throat> Sorry, my blood pressure is up. <laughs> um, and then we hear, oh, this issue's already been addressed. 
We already took care of this. Then why are we here? Why do the stories continue? Why do we hear doctor after doctor and patient after patient say the same thing, that my care is delayed, that I'm going to be in trouble, that I'm going to be unsafe because my care is delayed? And then the cost of that goes to the family, the cost of that goes to the patient, and the cost of it goes to the provider because of all the mountains of paperwork they have to do. And yet it is a cost-containing, useful tool. So, you know, I heard we, we can find a balance. We can find a balance that people get their treatment after review. So I want to be clear that in 2024, the care that you get is dictated by someone who has never seen you or touched you or talked to you and not by your doctor. And that is something we should all be angry about. So thank you. <laughs> did, did you have any final comments? <laughs> Madam Chair, I'm going to leave you with the final word. Thank you. <laughs> with that, the, uh, the bill is laid over. Thank you, Senator Mann, for chairing for me. And thank you, Senator Morrison. Um, next, we will move to, to Senate File 3989. Senator Hoffman. Senator Hoffman, 30, Senate file 3989 has been to your committee. There's one um, part that's under our jurisdiction. Um, please go ahead and, and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And, and this is a work that is um, actually um, uh, done in, in uh, lots, of, lots of folks working on this. And I just want to say, <laughs> members, as we know, the decompression and getting patients out of the hospital when they're ready to be discharged has become a major, major issue uh, for complex uh, patients, all patients actually. Challenges in transitioning uh, patients to the right level of care when they no longer need acute care treatment disproportionately affects folks with complex needs and those that are eligible for various health care and human services programs that we all oversee. Um, what this leads to is, is a uh, patient flow challenge. Uh, boarding patients in EDs, we've heard that comment many times, Madam Chair, um, that adds a huge financial strain to many hospitals and health systems, and that's what they're dealing with today. And just yesterday, I remember Senator Atke talked about the 195,000 avoidable days in the hospitals um, that are across the state. These are days when the patients no longer meet the medical criteria for hospitalization, but they're stuck for various reasons. Um, there's ca bed capacity and workforce challenges, but there's just three main components to this bill that you're looking at is the streamline, streamlining or prioritizing the min choices assessment, the Medicaid eligibility determination, and then the rate setting process with community providers. So um, section two, Madam Chair, is really what falls in your jurisdiction and that intends to tighten the timeline uh, for Medicaid applications for those patients who are stuck in the hospital waiting for Medicaid eligibility determinations. Conversations, Madam Chair, just to let you know, and you're aware of this, that are, are ongoing as we continue on getting the language right to make sure this has a meaningful impact. And again, yesterday's comments that one of the two or three or four doctors on this committee said, the patients, right? It's that patient-centered piece. So I'm gonna turn it over, I think, uh, Ms. Krinky or somebody from the Minnesota Hospital Association should be here. If not, then um, why don't we just pass it and move it back to me and then we can get on. Um, Senator Hoffman, I do have on the list, is Jill Pooler on the Zoom? Um, I did have uh, her on the list as a testifier and she's on Zoom. Uh -huh. If you could please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jill Fuller, and I am uh, the Aging and Disability Social Services Manager at Wright County Health and Human Services. I'm here today on behalf of the Minnesota Association of Social Service Administrators, or MAXA, 
and the Minnesota Intercounty Association, also known as MICA. From a high level, I want to say a counties agree with the expressed concern of people not being able to discharge from the hospital setting in a timely manner. That is, of course, not healthy for anyone. We support some of the language in the bill and, and, and in the amendment. However, we do have concerns about a few provisions and believe that there may be more practical ways to approach effective solutions together. With regard to the min choices aspects, counties have been engaged with hospitals, disability advocates from the ARC Minnesota and DHS with a focus on reducing the complexity of the assessment itself, thus decreasing the amount of time per assessment and increasing the number of people we would be able to serve. The amendment does address some of this conversation. The counties are in support of allowing assessments to remain valid for 365 days. This would avoid staff and clients needing to complete repeat work through the eligibility update process. We are also in support of the credentialing changes related to Min Choices certified assessors. We believe that eliminating the requirement that a person must have two years of experience specifically relating to home and community-based services would help with our work workforce issues that we are all experiencing. We do have concern about some of the timeline pieces and the process provisions included within this bill. First, I can attest that counties would already be meeting the timelines laid out in this legislation if we had the capacity to do so. We share the same goal with hospitals in providing services to, climb, to clients timely. That is also our intention. Unfortunately, our current system and program expectations make that unattainable and frankly unrealistic despite our best efforts. Putting more emphasis on people in hospital settings would force counties to shift and pull resources away from other individuals who may actually have more intensive medical, psychiatric, or safety needs than the person who is awaiting discharge from the hospital. Putting priority language, uh, sorry, putting priority language in legislation is a slippery slope considering how many residents we actually serve. This will create ethical dilemmas within the county decision making. I would hate to see our county processes bogged down further by adding regulations attempting to prioritize one vulnerable group over another. Finally, we understand the intention of creating an initial financial incentive to providers through the supplemental payment. This, though that may be a good idea in concept, it may cause unnecessary strife between the county and providers when ongoing rates later are, will need to be re reduced to comply with the ongoing state standards. We look forward to continuing discussions with legislators and hospitals to collaborate on ways to solve these systematic complexities. We appreciate your time and opportunity to testify. Thank you for your attention and I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Danny Eckert, if you could state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Danny Eckert with the Minnesota Hospital Association. I'm here today in support for Senate File 3989. Hospitals have a singular responsibility to provide care to every patient that comes to them through the emergency department. Therefore, hospitals routinely provide care to patients with the most acute and complex care needs. And it is these patients, often the most vulnerable, that consistently remain unnecessarily stuck in hospitals despite being ready for discharge. <clears throat> Too often, this is due to obtaining the needed government assessments and approvals to get benefits in place and to get access to eligible services in appropriate non-hospital care settings. <clears throat> in 2023, patients across the state spent roughly 195,000 avoidable days in hospitals, including over 9,000 days of emergency department boarding. The avoidable days significantly increased weights for other patients, forced some patients and families to find care options elsewhere, often with uh, maybe life-altering delays, and it cost Minnesota hospitals and health systems an estimated $480 million <clears throat> in unpaid patient care. The unprecedented number of avoidable days is due to multiple factors, including significant delays waiting for a min choices assessment, the lack of available and appropriate supported decision making, including guardianship, and notably, consistent delays in medical assistance application processing. P pending MA applications too often leave patients waiting in the hospital for weeks or even months after they no longer need inpatient hospital care. Such delays must be minimized. <clears throat> As such, Senate File 3989 seeks to begin addressing MA application delays by requiring an expedited process for hospital patients awaiting discharge that also require MA coverage to be admitted for their post-acute care need in the appropriate care setting. 
In the event information is missing to complete an MA application process, which does happen, the, uh, this bill also establishes, establishes an escalation process at the state and county to assist in obtaining the necessary information to complete the application in a timelier manner. To go, together, both of these provisions will reduce unnecessary application delays. Now, in closing, we look forward to working with Senator Hoffman, uh, other stakeholders, including counties, uh, to advance this bill in order to ensure that ME application timelines are reduced and that all patients receive the care they need when and where they need it. I also urge this committee to hear Senator Morrison's bill, Senate 2085, which provides needed uh, financial support to hospitals in response to the unprecedented avoidable days. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. With that, I stand for any questions. Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any questions about the bill? Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I recognize the limited jurisdiction here, and we'll finish up other questions I have on the rest of the bill. Uh, but this is, I think, a, a good start. I think half the trouble is that how do you get people plugged into the right pair? Mm -hmm. um, so I just, it's thanks. So good. Any other, Senator Morrison? Thank you, Madam Chair. My comment is similar to Senator Abler's. Um, I want to thank Senator Hoffman for bringing this forward. Uh, this has to be part of a holistic conversation that we have about our current conundrum uh, in our healthcare workforce, in our hospitals, in our discharge delays, uh, in the strain on our healthcare workforce. Um, this is one piece of that holistic look, mm -hmm. keeping the patient at the center always. So I just want to thank you. Appreciate it very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, seeing no other member questions or comments, Senator Hoffman, any final thoughts? You know, Senator, uh, Madam Chair and members, there's still one spot left, Senator Morrison, if you want to get on it, but I want to thank Senator Mann, Senator Abler, and Senator Seberger for being co-authors of this bill, and it is. It's one small uh, move in the right direction on the process, and, and I look forward to the continued conversations we're having collectively. So thank you, Madam Chair and members. So I think, what are we doing with this? Um, I think Going to the floor? Moving, uh, no, we're moving it back to your committee, Senator Hoffman. So your motion is uh, that Senate file 3989 be recommended to pass and be referred to Human Services. So, so moved. Uh, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail. Senate file 3989 is passed and referred to the Committee on Human Services. Next, we have Senate File 4135, Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Senate File 4135 directs DHS to participate in the Restaurant Meals Program through the USDA. The Restaurant Meals Program is a terribly named program because it has nothing to do with restaurants. I don't know who named it. Um, but it is a state option to allow certain SNAP clients who might not be able to prepare their own meals for themselves or who don't have permanent housing uh, for storing and preparing food to be able to buy prepared meals with their SNAP benefits at places that already offer um, SNAP benefits. So um, there, again, this is limited in Minnesota to existing uh, EBT transfer providers such as grocery stores and not restaurants. Um, and again, the issue is that people uh, with unstable housing or uh, disabilities can't prepare their own foods. Um, that's really about it, Madam Chair. Thank you. I have, I have one testifier, uh, Commissioner Rena Morian. Welcome to our committee, Commissioner Moran. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. All right. Well, good morning, Madam Chair and members, uh, for having me at uh, this committee hearing this morning and for hearing this bill. I am Ramsey County Commissioner Rena Moran. Proceed. Please proceed. Okay. So participation in this federal program is important because people who are unstably housed may not have access to a kitchen to cook or the ability to heat up food. Elderly or disabled individuals may have a difficult time preparing food. In addition, this change will encourage more to apply for SNAP. Minnesota has one of the lowest SNAP participation rate among those who qualify. I have some data to share to highlight why this change is beneficial. 
In 2022, over 17,000 SNAP recipients in Ramsey County were over the age of 55, approximately 20% of overall SNAP participants. As the population ages, these rates are expected to increase as adults over 65 are the fastest growing age group of Ramsey County residents. Across Minnesota, 33% of SNAP participants are in families with members who are elderly or have a disability. As an individual who are unstably housed, in 2023 point in time count, 1,680 homeless individuals were identified in Ramsey County. 177 were youth and 107 were veterans. Racial disparities in home ownership and difficulties assessing affordable housing are reflected in Ramsey County unhoused population, with 70% reported as a person of color. So we know that all of these people matter in Minnesota and to Ramsey County. By participating in the res uh, restaurant meal program, which we know this name is a little deceptive because it has nothing to do with a restaurant, but instead, our SNAP participant will have the option to do something as simply as go to the grocery store, pick up a rotisserie chicken, some mashed potatoes, or some hot soup, and enjoy a hot meal even when they are unable to cook it for themselves. So I want to thank you. I want to thank Senator Mann for uh, bringing this uh, bill forward. I want to thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the hearing. And um, I want to thank you for your support. Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any questions or comments about the bill? Senator Ebler. Yeah, thanks, Senator Mann. I actually like the bill. It's actually really more of a quick trip. Uh, thing and so could you actually just as the thing moves you might want to just get rid of the word restaurant and put hot like hot meals um, I mean seriously I, the restaurant oh yeah I mean, they can't come to our restaurant and and buy dinner but that it's and you don't want to get this misconstrued but it's a good idea and it just makes sense and so I mean or hot dinner program or something you know so mm -hmm. anyway, thank you Senator Mann, I don't know. Is there a way to change? Madam that? Chair, Senator Abler. So it's what it's federally called. That's why it, that's the way it is here. We didn't change it, but again, it's very poorly named. So we can look into changing our own language, see if we can do that. Madam Chair, okay. it's a, Senator Abler. If the feds want to be quirky. Doesn't mean we have. We could lead the way. Minnesota could lead the way in improving <laughs> this program. Anyway, nice to see you, Commissioner. By the way, thanks. Good to see you. Any other questions? Seeing none, um, Senator Mann, any final comments? Um, Senate file 4135 will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. And now we have um, Senator Latz, Senate file 3313. Welcome to the committee, Senator Latz. We don't see you very often um, in this committee. Um, I believe there is an amendment. Do you want to talk about the amendment and um, adopt it? This isn't the first stop for the bill, so um, do you want to talk about the amendment at the beginning, um, or it needs to be passed out, I believe? Um, if, if I may, Madam Chair, I'd like to give a brief description of the bill. And then uh, the amendment is the product of discussions with the Department of Human Services. And so I have uh, Michelle Timmons with me, um, who is uh, involved in those discussions, and she can describe the amendment. And then we'll ask to have it added, if that's OK with the chair. Yes, that's, that's fine. Um, the amendment is being passed out, so we'll have it. And um, Senator Latz, please proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members. Um, this is a bill that has two main features. One, it's to make the criminal justice system work better for uh, people who are uh, charged with a crime and determining whether and how to resolve uh, that criminal charge by giving them full information at various points in the process as to what the consequences would be 
if they resolve the case with a conviction for uh, one uh, offense or another. Um, these are not the criminal sanctions that they would be facing, but rather the collateral consequences that flow from a conviction. These are consequences that are described in other parts of Minnesota law. Let's say if you're convicted of this, that, or the other thing, you will have the following additional consequences, licensing consequences um, at DHS, driver's licenses, literally hundreds of other places in the statutes that describe these things. And most criminal defendants have no idea what those consequences will be um, as they're contemplating how to resolve a case. The second main point of this bill is to provide a path uh, for setting aside those collateral consequences either at the time the criminal case is resolved um, or at the time uh, that a person is being uh, released from prison if that is the, uh, the criminal consequence for them. Uh, those uh, processes um, uh, would involve uh, motions and hearings and determinations by either a judge or by the commissioner of corrections. Uh, what we have before you today um, uh, for this committee's consideration um, are uh, uh, language relating to how the uh, human services related collateral consequences would be impacted. Um, I have with me to testify uh, the, uh, the former Minnesota Reviser of Statutes, now a member of the Uniform Laws Commission, Michelle Timmons. We also have available uh, Bob Tennyson, former state senator, also a member of the Uniform Law Commission. Um, and both of them have been involved um, in this process, including the drafting of the uniform law um, that's being used nationally. Uh, so I'd ask the uh, committee to hear Ms. Timmons testify and then ask the committee to adopt the uh, A2 amendment. Welcome to the committee. Uh, Ms. Timmons, please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Thank you, Senator Latz. I'm Michelle Timmons, um, Uniform Law Commissioner and former Minnesota Reviser of Statutes. Um, essentially what happened is that after uh, Senate File 3313 uh, passed out of Senator Latz's uh, Judiciary Committee last week, um, Commissioner Tennyson and I received concerns from the Department of Human Services about how this bill would apply to that department. And essentially what the Department of Human Services said is that Chapter 245C really governs how the department is to deal with all the collateral sanctions that are within the scope of the Department of Human Services and Chapter 245C is also how the department complies with federal law in regards to these um, sanctions. And so ultimately after Commissioner Tennyson and I had um, studied the concerns of DHS and had some correspondence back and forth, uh, we did agree that it was probably easiest and cleanest under all the circumstances to exempt uh, the department or 245C from, uh, from being covered by the uh, orders for limited relief or the certificate of restoration of rights, the two relief provisions that Senator Latz just mentioned. So, um, uh, Council, thank you for preparing an amendment. Uh, and the amendment does do that. It makes it clear that the two uh, certificates, the two relief mechanisms would not apply to collateral sanctions imposed by the Department of Human Services. But what it would do is still leave the uh, compilation and notice provisions about collateral sanctions um, w those would still include those that are involved in the DHS area um, uh, the earlier uh, provisions changing same to substantially similar is a is a very friendly amendment that improves the language um, in the bill and so um, again, thanks to Senate Council for preparing this amendment and uh, as 
uh, a representative of the Uniform Law Commission. We do not oppose it. We are in support of the uh, concepts behind it. Thank you. So, um, Senator um, Latz, uh, let's see, I'll ask um, Senator Mann, can you move the A2 amendment? Um, members, do you have any questions about the amendment? Um, seeing none, um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The A2 amendment is adopted. Um, and you said Mr. Tennyson oh. is just for, here for oh, questions. Is that correct? That's okay. correct, Madam Chair. Senator Abler. Well, thanks. And it's actually appropriate Senator Mann made the amendment because this involves 245C, her favorite new chapter of law after last <laughs> night. And so that's why it's here, Madam Chair, is for um, 245C questions. Is that right? Okay. I believe so. Is okay. That Actually, I figured out the bill. I read it. I'm like, what is this here for? So thank you. Uh, I just have a question, Senator Latz. I, uh, Senator, Rep. Senator Lesh and I have tried for a long time to help some people who are snared in unnecessary disqualifications to maybe have a chance to work again. Uh, is on page 12, uh, lines 12 to 17, it looks like that's kind of a flexibility piece of language. Um, I hope that's what it does. Uh, in the case where it would make sense to relieve, where the commissioner has authority to use some set-asides. Uh, is that what that means, or did I read it wrong? But if it says that, I like it, so. Senator Latz. Um, Ms. Madam Timmons? Chair and members, Senator Abler, I wonder if um, if council would have any uh, comment on this. I'm wondering, that is in, uh, the provision you cited is in the conforming amendments. And with the amendment uh, that basically says the two uh, Me mechanisms of relief don't apply to DHS. I don't know if that would be necessary. Ms. Hoffman Litchie, would you be able to respond? Uh, Madam Chair, members, um, plain reading the language, it uh, does allow the commissioner to set aside disqualification. However, with the amendment, the order for limited relief and the certificate of restoration of rights do not apply to any collateral sanction imposed by the department. And so I would assume that this section no longer applies. Like the commissioner wouldn't be able to set aside. Senator Abler. Uh, too bad, Madam Chair. Thanks. I, I favor giving the commissioner more authority to intervene where they think there's good reason to let somebody be allowed to function. So anyway, Senator Latz, thanks. Maybe we can fix that on the floor. Uh, anyway, so you, you know what I'm after, and uh, but I, maybe it's not possible. So thank you. Senator Latz. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, I agree with you. And one of my frustrations over the years has been the lack of flexibility under the statute for the commissioner to set aside disqualifications um, that might be appropriate for equitable reasons uh, particular to a case. So to the extent that we could um, open up that discretion for the commissioner, I would fully support that. Seems to me this would be the place, this committee would be the place to do that rather than on the floor. Uh, so I'm certainly open uh, to a conversation about that if it can be done consistently with uh, the conversation that we've had with DHS in preparation for today's hearing. Madam Chair, Senator I, I know Abler. we're kind of running low on time, but mm -hmm. I, that was a discussion last night, and I think there's some interest in that. And so this bill is going to move elsewhere, I presume. And is that right, Senator Lenz? It, Senator mm -hmm. Latz, this bill, um, we, I'm showing that it needs to go to state government. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, there's a rulemaking provision that will take it to state government, and then it comes back to judiciary because there's a fiscal note that uh, would be right. involved so as well time. for commissioner or for corrections. So, Madam Chair, uh, just... But this would be the committee right. 
to address that particular question. So, uh, so Madam Chair, I'm going to work on that topic a little more, and so maybe this is a vehicle to carry the result of that discussion. So anyway, um, so I, I think that maybe as a committee we're friendly to that. Is that fair to say, Madam Chair, um, conceptually? It could be. I guess <laughs> it would be, be <laughs> would, would be better if we had, you know, if we had the actual you want language. An actual amendment? Okay. Yes, an okay, actual I'll, amendment. I'm offering a concept so. today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Latz, are you saying you are amenable to moving it to state government and taking that as consideration, or are you suggesting that you'd like to keep it here in Health and Human Services? Uh, Madam Chair, I'll leave it to the chair to determine um, how you wish to uh, handle that particular question. I'm happy to continue conversations with Senator Abler, and if the chair is okay to address those issues um, at a different stop, or if, if you were to decide you'd like to consider it more fully in front of your committee to bring it back here to accomplish that. Um, thank you, Senator Latz. I, I think today it needs to go on to state government because we have a really full schedule and but if um, Senator Abler I would yeah ask if you feel that what you're suggesting and is not something or is something that the full committee should really review um, let's talk about that so thank you any any other questions or comments about the bill uh, seeing none Senator Latz do you have any final comments uh, th this is an opportunity to give people um, full information and transparency as they make decisions that could be critical uh, for their own individual futures. Uh, and, uh, and then, under the right circumstances, gives an off-ramp, uh, or an on-ramp, really, for those folks um, who uh, have proven that they have corrected their ways uh, to get back on track to be more productive citizens and, and, uh, uh, and law-abiding citizens. So we appreciate the support of this committee uh, for opening up those two avenues of relief. Madam Chair. Senator Abler. I'll move my latest favorite bill to be recommended it pass and go to state government. Senator Abler moves that Senate File 3313, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on State Government. Members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail. Senate file 3313, as amended, is passed and referred to the Committee on State Government. Thank you, Senator Latz. Thank you. Next up, Senate file 4861. There is an A1 author's amendment that is in your packet members. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, actually, I, I'd like to just briefly talk about the bill language. The, the amendment is related to a slightly different topic, and I'd like to have um, the Department of Health be able to help me address that. Please um, proceed. Um, so this bill, Senate file 4861, relates to uh, 340B reporting. And um, I, I think in your packet you have uh, a letter and, and some information about 340B drug pricing. Uh, but at, at a very high level, um, the federal 340B program is a, a program that requires pharmaceutical manufacturers participating in Medicaid to sell outpatient drugs, including drugs administered to patients by providers at significantly discounted prices to specific safety net healthcare providers, which are known as 340B covered ent entities. Uh, the program is designed to ease the financial hardship that high and rising prescription drug prices impose on safety net, um, uh, safety net providers and um, to be clear, there are several types of hospitals and outpatient facilities that are eligible for the program, including uh, federal, federally qualified health centers, Ryan White HIV clinics, various types of hospitals, and specialized clinics. Covered entities must recertify their eligibility every year. 
Um, the program has expanded rapidly in recent years, but there's not, um, not a lot known about 340B revenue or how entities use the additional resources. And there's no federal requirement that providers pass the drug discounts to their patients. Um, in 2023, we included in the um, Senate file 2995 uh, requirement um, to have the department develop a reporting, um, a report basically, and collect information from covered entities. Um, the language included in Chapter 70 in 2023 had the intent to bring some basic information about the 340B program to the public and Minnesota legislators. Um, this is, uh, because there is limited inf information, it's an area of high policy interest across the country, and uh, few states have been able to implement um, meaningful any mini meaningful reporting. Um, and over the past several months, um, the Department of Health has worked to prepare for the first round of reporting, which is underway and due April 1st of 2024. Um, draft guidance was published, and um, so that the um, draft guidance was published late last year, and they received feedback from numerous stakeholders. So this bill um, provides some technical fixes that address the feedback that the Department of Health has received and they're intended to provide further clarity. Um, they formulate definitions that align with existing 340B um, HRSA reporting repar requirements. Uh, they clarify reporting obligation and scope, including ambiguity about whether providing admin, oh, excuse me, provider administered drugs are included. Uh, clarifies treatment of non-public data, scope and granularity of reporting and it allows um, MDH to get to grant exemptions under certain circumstances. So that's, um, that's what the bill does. You'll see that uh, there is basically new language and then re repealing the, um, the original report and just it's moving it to a different, um, different place in statute. And so I think there is one testifier Mr. Acker. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, my name is Danny Acker with the Minnesota Hospital Association. So, uh, through continuous work with the Department of Health, our members are making final preparations to submit the first round of 340B covered entity reporting in just a few weeks on April 1st, 2024. Um, this first in the nation, state-level reporting on the federal 340B drug pricing program has required a significant investment of time and attention from not just hospitals and health systems, but all safety net 340B covered entities in Minnesota. Senate file 4861 adds new reporting elements while keeping the initial April 1st, 2024 deadline, which immediately led us to be concerned about what would be due when. Um, we believe our concerns on when the new reporting elements are actually due uh, can and will be met, but we still need clarity in language um, and clear expectations. As such, we are standing by, uh, standing by to work with Chair Wickland and the department to ensure that such clarity is achieved. Our initial concern on the new reporting deadline is the specific ad addition of administered outpatient drugs throughout the reporting requirements. Administered drugs, when provided, are not reimbursed directly, rather they are re reimbursed in a bundled hospital diagnostic related group or DRG. So to, to, to determine the specific reimbursement for administered drugs, as is asked on lines 2.17 and 2.18, will require an entirely new and costly methodology to unbundle a specific portion of a bundled DRG. So to our knowledge, this is not regularly done, if at all, ever. And therefore, we ask Chair Wickland and the department to engage with MHA and our member hospitals to ensure appropriate clarity in language and with the understanding that precision on unbundling a bundle uh, may not be possible. Uh, in closing, the federal 340B drug pricing program has served as an integral support system for safety net hospitals and providers 
in Minnesota and across the nation since 1992. It directly supports patient care services and access where others can't or, or simply won't, and it is woven into the level of care that all Minnesotans expect and deserve. So I want to thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chair Wickland, um, and I, for that, stand any questions. Thank you, Mr. Eckert. Did you want someone to talk about the amendment now? Yes, if I could have, um, if there is someone uh, from the Department of Health who can explain better. Um, this, the amendment relates to a different uh, aspect of MDH's work on prescription drugs. Um, this has to do with the prescription drug price transparency and, um, and I would request that um, a testifier could explain the amendment better than I can. So. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Madam Chair, members of the committee, good morning. Uh, my name is Stefan Gildemeister. I direct the Health Economics Program in the Minnesota Department of Health, uh, and we are responsible for implementing the provisions of the Prescription Drug Transparency Act, as well as the 340B provision that, that you've just dis discussed. Um, to the to the note uh, to the amendment, um, it uh, exempts a small portion of the prescription drug uh, transparency initiative uh, uh, from from expedited rulemaking, uh, and I think um, maybe if I can say a few more things on that, the the primary purpose of the prescription drug. Uh, uh, transparency law is to obtain data from across the supply cha chain, uh, the prescription drug supply chain, PBMs, pharmacies, uh, manufacturers, wholesalers, uh, to collect information that will assist you in developing policies to make prescription drugs more affordable. And uh, um, one element of that approach is to develop quarterly lists of drugs that are considered to be uh, of substantial public interest. Um, there are two primary reasons for this proposed change. Um, the first is that the subdivision uh, 10 that governs this, uh, this initiative and that uh, the development of the list uh, already has uh, considerable uh, inst clear instructions uh, to the commissioner uh, uh, on the factors that she needs to consider to develop these lists. And it doesn't already include um, a reference to uh, obtaining public input on the development of, of, uh, of, the, of these lists. So um, it is unclear, uh, given this direction, it's unclear that, the, that a Subdivision 16 of the broader bill was actually intended for the developing development um, of, of this quarterly initiative. I think more importantly, um, it's really logistically impossible uh, to meet the requirement of the law uh, to develop relevant and timely uh, quarterly lists of drugs um, while going through the rulemaking process that typically takes six to nine uh, uh, months. Uh, we couldn't do this uh, four times a year. Uh, we couldn't do the one. We couldn't do this once a year, let alone four times a year. So um, it is more a clarification to say um, the rulemaking authority is not specific to subdivision ten. Uh, I'm, I hope that wasn't too long of an explanation. Thank you, Mr. Yelmeister. Uh Members, questions? Seeing none. Uh, Senator Ruckett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've got a question, and uh, we'll bring Mr. Ackert back up to the uh, testifier station here. And that's um, under the enforcement and exceptions. You had commented that some of these um, reports come to you or to the hospitals kind of bundled, um, and it might be a, a challenge to unpack what's all in there for reporting. Um, and under subdivision four, there's a penalty. Will you, are there concerns with that? I mean, do you have concerns on being able to do this so that you, they can stay away from the penalties, or is it okay? Mr. Ackert. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Uckey. So the concern is that the, the new element on administered drugs being added in this language still includes that April 1st, 2024 deadline. We've spoken to the, to the department 
their expectation, at least our understanding through that conversation, is that the new elements would be reported in April 1st, 2025. If it, if, if there is something that changes in that expectation and it would be required by April 1st, 2024 to do the administered drugs reporting, we would have, it would be a significant challenge, uh, nearly impossible for our members to have that without an extension. And if an extension was granted, we at this time cannot give you a timeline on how long that extension would be needed for because we're going into a unknown process to, again, unbundle that bundled diagnostic related group. Senator Ecke. Thank you, Madam Chair. So at this time, you're still working with the department and such. So there's <coughs> hope that it's the concern goes away, but at this point, there's still unknowns. Mr. Eckert. Madam Chair, Senator Ecke, yes. I mean, we're, we're seeking clarity. I think we're on the same page. It is, unless things really speed up for this bill, we don't think it'll be passed by April 1st, 2024. So there's that kind of dynamic. The language stays the same, uh, but we're making our concerns known on the administered drugs. I think we're, we're moving forward and we're all on the same page. Senator Ecke. Thank you. Senator Abler. I thought we were going to vote on the amendment. That's um, why I'm waiting. So I just wanted I'm, I'm to trying. commend the bill and the Senator Wickland for working on this. I think we do want to know the value of all this stuff. And I just had one comment. I don't know why every bill we have has some punitive thing, 500 bucks a day. And at least there's a good faith exception. But I don't know that the hospitals, just as you show mercy, that they need to have that threat. So I think they'll happily comply. Thank you. Okay. It's a good bill. Thank you. So uh, uh, the general something. No, I was just going to move the A1 amendment so we can vote on that. Motion is to move the A1. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? The A1 is adopted. Thank you. To the bill is amended. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, Senator Wicklin, would you like to make a motion? Um, I move that uh, Senate File 4861, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on State Government. On that motion, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? The bill passes. Thank and you, Madam Chair. Yes. And with that, we are adjourned. See what I did there?